You can have multiple containers within one pod. However, usually you would want to have one container. This Hello there and welcome to day three of 100 days of Kubernetes. Today I'm going to be focusing on worker nodes and specifically pods within worker nodes. So for those who are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Anais. I'm right now doing a challenge of 100 days of Kubernetes in which I aim to learn something new each day about Kubernetes and share it with you here on this YouTube channel. So if you want to follow along, please hit subscribe and let's dive right in. So what are pods? What are worker nodes? How do they interact? What, are, what do they have? What are their purposes? Let's look at that. So we have here again our Kubernetes cluster. And we interact with that through kubectl. And usually we will interact with the API server that's within our main node. So this is the main node, master node. And then let's have here our worker nodes. In this case, we're going to have three, three different ones. Now, like mentioned yesterday, the main node has a kubelet and a kube proxy. And that interacts here with our worker nodes. And each worker node has their own kubelet, kubelet and kube proxy each of them. Now the kubelet is responsible for interacting with the container runtime. Now the container runtime is for example container D or Docker that is responsible for running our container. And the kube proxy is responsible for managing the connectivity, the network connection between pods as well as between nodes. Now we have here let's say our Docker container and in the Docker container we have whatever the container is supposed to run, whatever processes the container is supposed to run. Now we tell Kube through Kubelet, we tell our um, cluster, hey, please run this container as a pod. So it will go ahead and the Kube scheduler will then determine which node, which of those worker nodes is the best suited for setting up our um, container. And then it will spin up a pod. So let's say this is a pod within our container. No, this is a pod. So this is a pod within our node here, within node one. And the pod is basically um, responsible for running an instance of an application. Now this instance of the application is represented through the Docker container and the processes within. So it's an abstraction of our Docker container. Um, we can have multiple containers within one pod. However, usually you would want to have one container. It makes it easier for debugging and just monitoring. However, in some occasions you might have the application server, a monitoring container, as well as a logging container. In that case, the monitoring and logging would be shared across the cluster and across um, the organization to have insights on the pod. However, usually you would want to have just one container within your pod. Now, we can have multiple pods in one node. However, those are limited within the resource limits of that node. So we might want to spin up another pod in the other node. If there is more space, depending on the size of our pod and like just the resources that our pod requires. So now let's imagine we have here two pods. And there are another pod in our node too. And those pods, they have to communicate somehow. Now, whenever a pod is spun up, they are assigned to an IP address. So this is a, has an IP address, this has an IP address, this has an IP address. And the IP address is managed through the kube proxy. Now the kube proxy has an IP table that basically configures the IP addresses between pods. Um, the problem now here is that pods are not consistent. They are not long lasting usually. It's quite common that they fail or that pods have to be removed um, for maintenance purposes of the cluster or whatever. 
And the thing is, the whole thing about Kubernetes and about DevOps is, and about uh, yeah, continuous integration, continuous deployment is anything, any resources that you have running on your cluster, they should be able, you should be able to spin them up in seconds right away again. Like if something fails, it should be quite easy to revert to a previous state or to spin it up again. You should not rely on like specific hard coded um, configurations. So if we have multiple containers within one pod, they can communicate through their local host. However, if the pods want to communicate between each other, they use their IP addresses. Now, every time we spin up a pod, it will be assigned a new IP address, which is obviously not too convenient. That's where we have usually a service wrapped around our pod that determines its fixed IP address. And that way the pod inside can fail and restart and fail and restart. And it won't matter that much because we have the service around. We will dive into services in another day. Um, for now, just remember that pods have an IP address. They have a persistent storage volume. We will look at volumes and persistent volumes later on. Um, and then they have their configuration, defining what is this pod supposed to look like. Now we can have specific controllers within our nodes that make sure that the pod is in the desired state. So the controllers, for example, a deployment controller will basically have the information of this is what the pod is supposed to look like and ensure that the pod is moving towards its desired state or is running its actual state. Now, pods, since they tend to fail quite easily and so on, we want to know which state or life cycle our pod is in. Now the first one is we can have a running, can you see that? Yeah, we can have a running pod. And in that case, um, all the containers within the pod um, are up and running. Um, and it's the pod is accepted by the node. It has a fixed node that it's in and the containers are running and it's in a running state. We can also have an unknown state. And if it's in an unknown state, it's, it's not too good because then the cluster doesn't know what state the pod is in. Similarly, we can have it in a oops, failed state. And if a pod is in a failed state, that means that all of the pods have terminated and at least one of the pods has failed, meaning that's in a non-zero um, exit code that's provided. Next, we can have a succeeded seeded state. And if a pod's in a succeeded state, that means that all of the processes that have that the pod was supposed to execute, or like the uh, obstructions of the containers with the processes within the pod, are all executed, it's done, it has succeeded, it has finished its purpose, it's done, right? Uh, for example, if a pod was supposed to calculate one plus one, it has done that, it succeeded, it's done, right? Then it's in a succeeded state. Lastly, we can have our pod in a pending state. And if it's a pending state, it means that the pod has been created within a specific node, but one or more of the containers within a pod are not yet running. They are not spin up. And that includes scheduling the, the containers, the processes within the pod, as well as downloading the images of those containers and setting up and running them. Now this is it for today. I hope it was useful. If it was, please give it a thumbs up or leave any comments, suggestions, anything I should be looking at in the upcoming days down in the comments. Also, if you would like to follow along this journey, subscribe to my channel to be informed about upcoming videos and content. If you would like to join our DevOps learning group, message me on Twitter. We would love to have you join us. Have a lovely day and I hope to see you next time. Bye bye.